Flat drop 101, man. You think we uh stalling, man? We on the neck bone of Hijack City. We on the ass, man. Flat drop 101. Ignition, man. Ignition. Let's go. All right. So that that particular video probably says as much or more about whether they ever actually went to the moon as it does about what we're talking about. But the Van Allen, Van Allen radiation belts are the excuse NASA has been using for why they haven't gone back to the moon and why they haven't gone to any other places with people. The radiation belts are the dome. NASA has a long history of lying to the American public about a number of things. Is it possible that the real reason that NASA has undertaken no recent space travel is not the Van Allen radiation belts, but is instead the dome of the firmament is up there. And the fact that there is no deep space to explore anyway. Is it possible that the firmament is up there and the sun, the moon, and the stars, whatever they are, that we're going to talk about next week in more depth, they're all inside the firmament, just like the Bible says, and there's not anywhere to go outside of that. Is that a possibility? I submit to you that's exactly what the Bible says, and there's no... And preaching man's preaching, but we have... Put a few more elements to the table. Worlds beyond the poles that they're actually getting out somewhat and finding more land, more worlds beyond the pole. Before I get part one, we popping off. It's not that there's nothing out there. It's just that to go and get the celestial flow, they have to go straight, not up. You don't see no Rocket launch is going straight up. They always curve, 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 curve until they are like airplanes going straight, not up. Let's go. Nothing out there for them to go to, and they've discovered that. They've even, even tried to break through it with 1.4 megaton yield explosives, and they still haven't gotten through it. And neither did Nimrod, by the way. Uh -oh. Here's some more verses about what the Bible says about the firmament, though. The book of Revelation describes the heaven rolling up like a scroll and men being able to behold God sitting on his throne when the heavens roll up like a scroll. This brings up two very important points. Number one, both Ezekiel and John in Revelation have described the firmament as the terrible crystal that separates the throne room of God above from the earth below. Number two, only something which is a solid, not a liquid or a gas, but a solid can be rolled up. Neither air, atmosphere, nor an expanse of any kind can be rolled up. You can't roll up space. Something has to be a material thing to be rolled up. The Bible tells us in Revelation 6.14, that the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and they saw him sitting on the throne. Folks, that's still in the future. It's going to happen one day. But the heavens can't roll up unless there's something there that can roll up. We've said this many, many times before, but you should always take the Bible literally unless it tells you to do otherwise. People start getting in trouble when they want to allegorize everything in the Bible. Unless it tells us to take it as a symbol for something, we're to take it literally. The heavens, if they're going to roll up like a scroll, there's got to be something that's going to roll up. I submit to you it's the terrible crystal firmament. Look what else the Bible says, though, in the end times about the heavens and the firmament. Peter also tells us that at the end of time, on this present earth, just before God creates a new heaven and a new earth, the heavens shall melt with fervent heat and be dissolved. This too brings up two important points to consider. Number one, only something that's solid, like the dome we've described as the firmament, can melt. You can't melt something that's a liquid or a gas. A li <laughs> and we know the... Or in their hijack, but even in their hijack, the shit just don't add up. Liquid's already a liquid. You can't melt a liquid. You can't melt a gas. So whatever it is that 
the heavens are that are going to melt with fervent heat, as Peter describes, it's something solid that's going to melt. Number two, Peter mentions the elements melting in reference to the heaven, not the earth. These can only be the elements which make up the firmament, a solid dome of some sort of crystal, according to Ezekiel and John. So when the heavens melt, the Bible says the elements of the heavens melt. What are the elements of heaven? It's not just some outer space. It's not just space. It's, it's a thing. It's something solid, something material. You can read the verses there in 2 Peter 3, verses 10 through 13, when you have time. Only a solid crystalline dome can be in view in all the passages of Scripture we've seen tonight. A vaulted dome which sits over the circle of the earth, exactly as the Scriptures have said all along. This is the last video I have for tonight. Firm, fixed, and movable. And that's what Isaiah 40, 22. You know, just read Isaiah 40, man. Um, we're surfing away with this preacher, man. Or why get part one? <laughs> We've been dissecting, you know what I'm saying? So if you're in part two, get part one. Let go. It's about a six or seven minute video, too. And I know my time's already way up. But I hope you'll stay because what the rainbow shows about the firmament is one of, I think, the biggest proofs that it's an actual firmament up there. It's an actual crystal firmament. Science tries to explain the production of rainbows by talking about how round water droplets in the atmosphere cause the arc-shaped prism that we call a rainbow. However, every single science experiment that you'll find online explains how you can create a rainbow inside a classroom but it requires the use of an extra mirror if you want to make a rainbow in the science classroom. Why do you have to have a mirror? The rainbow, by the way, that you make in the classroom is always the shape of whatever the mirror is you use in the science project. Mm. Keep that in mind. Mm. The water vapor can be produced inside. You can spray a spray bottle and make a mist inside. Great point. The more I do flat drive, the more great points come uh, from different people, man. This is preacher, man, but he, he he's feeling it, though. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So I'm seeing, we you know, what he's saying. I've never heard it before. Featured in flat drop 101 live in the ether, man. This is flat drop. Brand new series for my Naga surfing away right here. The rainbow is mimicking the same shape as the mirror. In this case, we're talking the glass ceiling or the firmament or the crystal throne. A was walking to and fro on the throne, looking down at us as grasshoppers. Isaiah 40. double rainbow you're really seeing this prism being reflected off again you know what i'm saying so now it's an inverted flow because it's being reflected again off this mirror this light source man get the drop you can do that a light source can be produced inside you can have a strong beam light shining in the science lab so you can spray the mist have the light but you still have to have a mirror in order to produce a rainbow in the science lab. So why do you need a mirror? What is the mirror supposed to be simulating in the science lab that's outside? Why do you not need a mirror out there? It's because the firmament is the mirror that's already out there. Evening, everyone. I thought I'd make a really, really quick, simple video on rainbows. Now, a lot of you, your whole life, have always wondered why that rainbow is in the shape of a dome. Why is it always arched? Okay. What I'm going to be showing you in this video is 
how that rainbow is formed, what causes that rainbow, and also at the same time, what causes the double rainbow above it. And it's really, really simple. Now, science will tell you that a rainbow is caused by sunlight and atmospheric conditions. Light enters a water droplet, slowing down and bending as it goes from air to denser water. The light reflects off the inside of the droplet, separating into its component wavelengths or colors. When light exits the droplet, it makes a rainbow. <laughs> okay, now for the most part, that's true. But what they're not telling you is that the raindrops are only there to work as a screen to capture what's being projected, okay? Now, in order to understand this, you have to be able to understand what refraction is. Refraction, deflection from a straight path undergone by a light ray or energy wave and passing obliquely from one medium such as air into another such as glass. Refraction, bouncing off of something, right? Deflection from a straight path, right? Then it undergone by a light ray or energy wave and passing obliquely <laughs> from one medium such as air to another such as glass in which its velocity is different. It's bouncing off. It's refracting. Air into another such as glass in which its velocity is different. Now here's an example of refraction. The white light has to pass through a prism, which is usually a glass or a crystal or a mirror, and cause uh, the colors to come out, which as you can see here, I'll break it down for you. Uh, the glass, the prism would be a glass of some sort, and it has to pass, hit that glass and refract, which will make the colors, as you can see here in the rainbow. Okay. Okay, now that you understand what refraction is, I'm going to show you how this rainbow is formed. Now, what you've got to tell yourself is, and we all know this, we've never seen a straight rainbow. We've never seen a rainbow going up, down, or down to up, or left to right, or even diagonally. It's always in the shape of an arch, in the shape of a dome. So here's what you have to remember. The white light is reflecting through a prism, which has to be glass, something of a glass form. So whatever that sunlight is hitting, when you see that rainbow, it's the shape of the prism that it's hitting, which is the glass firmament, the glass dome. That's why it's shaped the way it is. Now, the rainbow is always there. You just can't never see it unless it rains. The rain drops act as a screen, like if you were projecting a movie. The movie could be playing through the projector all day, but if it doesn't have a screen to reflect off of, you can't see it. But what you have to realize is the rainbow is always there. But the only time you see it is when it rains because the rain acts as the screen, like right here. Ah, come on, man. Get part one, man. We popping off. So, the rain or the mist is just a screen. The rainbow is always there. You need a projector screen to see it. Hawaii's covenant, Genesis, is always there. You need to observe. You need a medium of observation. And always you see the same arch, red at the top, all the way to the violet, purple, blue, all that, right? So... There ain't no LGBT about it, man. They took something natural that really reflects something connected with Hawaii's throne, Hawaii's covenant, turn it into their flag. Oh, but you got to invert it, boss. It's only inverted when it's being refracted or, you know, bouncing back. Now you got a double rainbow. And you got one inverted and one not based on the mirror or the crystallized uh, refraction, 
<laughs> reflection, refraction. You know what I mean? So it has nothing to do with your feelings and your sexual orientation and none of that. Blue, purple, red got everything to do with Aaron and the ten of meeting and the and the cold keepers, man. You know what I'm saying? The the garments. You know what I mean? That tabernacle flow. Not with your sexuality. You can't take our colors, blue, purple, red. You can't take the rainbow. It's the covenant of Hawa. But let's look at this smoke screen. Let's look at this, uh, how the rain acts as a screen. So you see the rainbows when it's raining because these droplets are acting like a projector screen. Check this out. There's always a rainbow out here. Now, if I take this water hose and I turn it on a mist, that mist makes a screen of water across the air. And it shows the rainbow, the reflection. Notice even right here where I'm at, it's still shaped like a dome. It's rounded because that's the shape of the prism that the sun is reflecting off of to give us this rainbow. Mm. It's really, really simple, folks. And like I said, it's in 3D also. You know, no matter which way you turn, that rainbow is always there as long as you've got that mist of water to give you your screen. So are you with me so far? And if you are, now I'm going to take you deeper into the rabbit hole. Now, you thought you were awake before. After I show you this, you're really going to be awake. Okay, here we have a rainbow over the ocean. Now, what I want you to pay attention to is the reflection of the rainbow over the water. Notice how the colors are inverted, which means back, reversed, backwards. Notice how the colors go backwards from the original rainbow on its reflection in the water. So we know in our simple common sense that that's a reflection of the rainbow, so it automatically reverses the colors. Just like if you and I looked in the mirror, the left side of our face would be the right side of our face, right? Okay, now that you understand that, Look at the double rainbow. Look at the rainbow on the outside of the original rainbow. Notice how the colors are reversed, just like they were when you seen the rainbow over water. That's because the firmament is the glass prism showing the reflection of the original rainbow. That's why the colors are backwards. Now, as you can see here, I've made a rainbow of colors on a piece of paper, but I'm showing you how the colors invert, how they reverse when I hold it in front of a mirror. Therefore, proving, proving, just like you've seen over water, when those colors are reversed, that's the reflection of the rainbow. <laughs> Shout out Dragon Child, man. We got a beautiful rainbow on our Nagaville flag. Somebody left a comment like, yo, you got to invert it. You got to invert the rainbow. <laughs> the LGBT is using the inverted rainbow. You got to invert it. Managa, these are Hawaii's colors. These are Hawaii's rainbow. This is Hawaii's spectrum, energy, frequency, vibration. Got nothing to do with sexuality, man. Your preferences of this and that. It's just stop the capery. It's scientifically speaking, it has everything to do with reflections and refractions and spectrums, white light going through glass prisms. Not your sexuality. Get out of the mind of a hijack. Let's go. On the permanent above. Now, if we look up how to make a rainbow inside, here's what it tells us. We need a flashlight or a sunny day, a mirror at least five by five, a pan of water, a CD, and a prism. We use this one. Why do you need a mirror, boss? Because that's the firmer man. Ketco light crystal prism 2.5. Now, here we go. I'm going to go through this really, really quick. We're going to fill the bowl of water. We're going to use the mirror. You have to remember that the mirror is flat. It's straight and flat. So, therefore, our rainbow, which is going to reflect on the wall, which would be your raindrops, your mist, which would be your screen, check this out. It's going to be a straight rainbow, a straight line, okay, because it's a straight, flat mirror. Now, check this out. If I take a round dome-shaped glass and let the sunlight shine through it, guess what I get? 
a rounded arch dome shaped rainbow just like you see every time it rains uh -oh. because the rain drops give you a screen to see what's projecting from above but even though i've made a double rainbow here it's not inverted the colors are not reversed because there's no reflection like you see here where the colors are reversed because what you are looking at is a reflection of the rainbow in the glass firmament above just like you see the reflection of the rainbow in the waters below it it's just a reflection and just like i showed you before the rainbow is always there you just need a screen to capture it just like you always need a movie screen to capture what's being projected out of the projector the movie if the rainbow is always there, then the covenant is always here. It's being projected. It's always there, but you need a screen to capture it like you see right here. So like I said, whenever you see that double rainbow, what they call a double rainbow, all you're looking at is a reflection of the rainbow, a mirrored image of the rainbow in the firmament above. God made the firmament to separate the waters below the firmament from the waters above the firmament. Everyone have a good night. All right. So the rainbow itself is a pretty good evidence that there's a mirror up there. Mm. There's something acting as a mirror. And the crystal of the firmament is the only thing that the Bible describes it could be what's providing that there are a couple of other things the bible talks about besides the firmament the bible talks about the windows of heaven above the firmament are waters and below the firmament are waters down here on the earth genesis 7 11 in the time of the flood says uh in the 600th year of noah's life in the seventh second month the 17th day of the month the same day where all the fountains of the great deep broken up as are below and the windows of heaven were open. There are apparently windows or doors in the firmament that God can open and close as he chooses and allow water from above to come down, just as he did in the days of the great flood. Again, at the end of the 40 days of rain on the earth in Genesis 8-2, it says the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained. So, all the water that's above the firmament didn't come down during the flood. There's still water up there. He opened them, opened the windows of heaven, allowed some of it to come down for 40 days and 40 nights, and then he closed them back up. And there's still water up there now. So there are windows of heaven. Remember what you and I are supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be in our minds building a model of what the earth and the universe looks like based on what the Bible is describing. We're going to look at it together that last week, but we're supposed to be building in our minds a biblical model that probably looks a whole lot like what we've already seen portrayed. There are also foundations of the earth, under the earth. The Bible teaches in numerous places that while the earth hangs on nothing in the face of the deep, it nevertheless has foundations upon which it rests. Wow, wow, Job 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place, hangs the earth upon nothing. That means nothing, man. <laughs> means you're not just uh, some ball hanging on something. You got foundations. You don't got to be hanging on nothing if you got foundations. Psalms 102.25, of old hast thou laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. Psalms 104.5, who laid the foundations, a ball doesn't have foundations, man. Now, when you're traveling 67,000 miles per hour, spinning at over 1,000 miles per hour, where's your foundations? Why do you see the same stars that our ancestors saw when you're going at 67,000 miles per hour, spinning at 1,100 miles per hour. You see the same constellations, man, for real? 
Traveling at 67 thou wow. It should not be removed forever, man. That means you ain't moving. Psalms 829, he has set for the sea its boundary. We're talking ice wall. So that the water would not transgress his command when he marked out the foundations of the earth. Isaiah 24, 18. For the windows from on high are open and the foundations of the earth do shake. But they're not moved. <laughs> they're not spinning at a thousand miles per hour. Isaiah 48, 13. My hand has also laid the foundations of the earth. My right hand. I beat it out. I span the heavens. Shamaim. I've spread them out. Etymology of planet is plain. Spread out flat. Job 38 verse 4. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare. If you have understanding, declare, man, where you were when I laid the foundations. Tell me, man. Whereupon are the foundations, therefore fastened, and who laid the cornerstone? <laughs> hey, how to Bob Marley. Here are a number of passages that all talk about the foundation of the earth, the foundations of the earth. You can read all of those at a later time, but there are foundations of the earth. It is sitting on the face of the deep, and there's something that God refers to as foundations whether it be blocks or the big turtle whatever you want to picture it as there's something that are the foundations of the earth upon which the earth rests when god created it there are also pillars of the earth holding up the earth from the foundations the bible also teaches that the foundation of the earth is built up held up by pillars um, you see a verse from Job and a verse from 1 Samuel that both talk about the pillars of the earth. And these are art, artist conceptions of what the pillars might look like. We don't know what they look like. But one thing we do know, NASA doesn't mind using all their cartoon experts to portray what they think things look like. So this is at least a possibility of what the, the pillars of the earth may look like underneath the earth. The Bible also talks about four corners of the earth, and I've had people ask me, how can the earth be either a circle or a globe and have four corners to it? This is one artist's depiction from the 1800s of how it's possible the earth could have four corners to it uh, if it's something like this. Ice wall wastelands, and you're just talking earth pond one the dome over the circle um, but revelation 7 and isaiah 11 both talk about the four corners of the earth and that's the end of our presentation for tonight i put those other things in there because i didn't have another good place to put them in our study but the firmament for me the firmament is what sealed the deal about the shape of the earth everything the bible says if you take it literally, there's a firmament up there, and it's still there, and it's going to be there until God melts it and makes a new heaven and a new earth. It's what separates us from the throne room of God. In my mind, once I accepted the fact that the earth wasn't a ball that was spinning and that all the sun, the moon, the stars, and everything the hardest part for me to wrap my mind around was if the earth isn't spinning in a 24 hour cycle, then all of that up there has to be going around the earth in 24, every 24 hours. And in my mind, I was thinking the way we've been taught to think our whole lives. And I'm thinking billions and trillions of light years away from earth. And I'm thinking, how can things that far away go fast enough to go around the earth every 24 hours when in reality if you just believe what the bible says there's a firmament up there and everything that's up there is in the firmament and it's not billions and trillions of miles away how far is it how far is the sun oh boy the moon oh boy well we'll talk more about that <laughs> next week
Next last, week, man. The next week will be the last. <sighs> Look, man. We got to get you, Nagas, to stop spinning. That's going to help you pop off because you're not spinning. You're still, you're firm, you're immovable. He has fixed the earth firm, immovable, Psalm 9610. Psalm 931, thou has fixed the earth immovable and firm. First Chronicles 1630, he has fixed the earth firm, immovable. Once you become immovable, you can see clearly. No play, play. No cap on my number two pencil. No cap on Antarctica's chest ball. We get you nuggets to stop spinning. Start keeping the cold. Know that you're from here. You're the copper color con. You got something to protect. They just found you here. And wow, know that you spiraling up in your 432. You in another frequency. You off that McDonald's 440. You popping off. Allow what for the formula. Thou did fix the earth on its foundations so that it could never be shaken. Who made the earth and fashioned it and himself fixed it fast. You are immovable. When you become immovable, you're ready to pop off. Suffice to say that the earth envisioned by flat earthers is as immovable as a geocentrist could desire. Most, perhaps all scriptures commonly cited by geocentrists have also been cited by flat earthers. The flat earth view is geocentricity with Further restrictions like geocentrist flat earth advocates often give long list of texts. Samuel Burley Robotham, founder of the modern flat earth movement, cited 76 scriptures in the last chapter of his monumental second edition of Earth, Not a Globe. Apostle Anton Darms, assistant to the Reverend Wilbur Glenn Voliva, America's best known flat earther, never heard of him, huh? <laughs> compiled 50 questions about the creation. But if he was somebody going with the grain, with high society, you would be hearing about him in every class you take. Just like you see the globe in every class, just like you see the globe in every cartoon. He compiled 50 questions about the creation and the shape of the earth, bolstering his answers up to with up to 20 scriptures each. Rather than presenting an exhaustive compendium of flat earth scriptures, I focus on those which seem to me the strongest. And I also comment on some attempts to find the earth's sphericity in the Bible. Let's go to the vault, man. The vault of heaven is a crucial concept. The word firmament appears in the King James Version of the Old Testament 17 times. And in each case, it is translated from the Hebrew word rakia, which meant the visible vault of the sky. The word rakia comes from rakwa, 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 meaning beaten out. In ancient times, brazen objects or brass objects were either cast in a form required or beaten into shape on an anvil. A good craftsman could beat a lump of cast brass into a thin bowl. Thus, Elihu asked Job, Can you beat out a raka, a rakwa, a rakia? The vault of the sky, as he does. Hard as a mirror. We talking rainbows. <laughs> Bye. Say it with me. Body bag for the illusion. Hard as a mirror of cast metal. Job 37, 18. Elihu's question shows that the Hebrew scripture, scripture considered the vault of heaven as a solid 
physical object, such a large dome would be a tremendous feat of engineering. So Hawaz claiming it like it's a large, tremendous feat of engineering. Hebrews considered the vault of heaven a solid physical object. The Hebrews and supposedly Hawa consider it exactly that. And this point is hammered home by five scriptures. Job 9 and 8, who by himself spread out the heavens. Shamayim. Psalm 19, 1, the heavens. Shamayim. Tell out the glory of Hawa, the vault of heaven. Rakia reveals his handiwork. That's physical work to create this crystal dome. Where's the crystal dome on your ball spinning at a thousand miles per hour? Traveling at 67,000 miles per hour, according to your master, NASA. Where's your vault of heaven, man? Psalm 102. The heavens, Shamayim, were your handiwork. Isaiah 45, 12, I, with my own hands, stretched out the heavens, Shamayim, and caused all their host to shine. Isaiah 48, 13, with my right hand, I formed the expanse of the sky, Shamayim. If those verses are about mere illusion of the vault, they are surely much ado about nothing. Shabayin comes from Shema, a root meaning to be lofty. It literally means sky. Other passages complete the picture of the sky as a lofty physical dome. A wa sits on the vaulted roof of earth. Kakwa or Kuwak. Earth, Kuwak, whose inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the skies, Shamayim, like a curtain. He spreads them out like a tent to live in. Isaiah 40, 22. Koog literally means circle, not ball, not sphere. Circle, boss. How many circles, Nas Confundin? How many ice walls? How many worlds? If I'm a Diogenini, worlds beyond a pole, how many worlds going straight? He spreads them out like a tent. You know what a tent looks like? Hawa. Wa means foundation, huh? Hebrew chart, paleo, Hebrew chart, Hawa. Right? I left strong power goes into the bed, the family, the family. You start to gather, walk through a door. Ha, ah, you get your breath. Wa, ah, you get your added secure hook. That's a foundation. It's called a tent peg, my naga. This tent peg is your foundation. When a dragon says, ah, wow, starts breathing fire, he's breathing security on you. When he takes the breath, ah, when she takes the breath, ah, not a man with arms raised. This is big mama giving you that look, Proverbs 8. The breath, the revelation. You get that look, you get that breath, you get that revelation. <gasps> Sound, A-H. <gasps> you get that breath, you get that security, you get that wa, Managi, you get that tent peg. With that tent peg, you popping off. With that tent peg, like a tent, my naga. Like a tent.
tent pay. You need to get foundation, but you can't have it without no breath. What's breath without security? What's security without breath? Ah, <sighs> wow. Before they turn it into VAV, this ain't no destruction. <laughs> this is your security before you get your food, your Zion, your Zion. Seven letter, seven days, cut off day, Shabbat day, nourishment. Then you start building a fence, a wall outside, divide. First, you got to get it cold to build your fence, man. And then we building a wall, Nehemiah. You know what I mean? Then you got your food before that. Before that, you got your security, your hook, your tent peg. Like a tent to live in, Isaiah 40, 22. Kaug literally means circle or encompassed. By extension, it can mean roundness like the firmament. How is a rainbow always arched, always arched, roundness like a rounded dome or vault, like a rounded dome. Job 22 verse 14 says, Hawa walks to and fro on the vault of heaven. This vault is your arch rainbow, my naga. In both verses, the use of kaug. Hebrew, right? We got it back to the Hebrew, implies a physical object on which one can sit and walk. Likewise, the context in both cases requires elevation. And Isaiah, the elevation causes the people below to look small as grasshoppers, boss. In Job, Hawa's eyes must penetrate the clouds. Wow. We have perspective. <laughs> Penetrate the clouds to see down on you, boss. Bird's eye view. Walking to and fro on the vault. Con. To view the doings of humans below. Elevation is also implied by Job 22, 12. Surely Hawa is at the zenith of the heavens, the top of the dome. Shamayim, spread out, flat, planet, flat, spread, spread out, boss. I'm talking planet, boss. What ball you know is spread out, boss? No ball, just more land. <laughs> Get the drop, man. This picture of the cosmos is reinforcing Ezekiel's vision. The word, the Hebrew word, rakia, appears five times in Ezekiel, four times Ezekiel 1, 22 through 26, and once in Ezekiel 10, verse 11. In each case, the context requires a literal vault or dome. The vault appears above the living creatures and glitters like a sheet of ice. Uh-oh. <laughs> We're talking ice walls. Above the vault is a throne of sapphire. Remember, you know, Preston with the sapphire uh, staff, the emerald staff. Emerald Sapphire. Seated on the throne is a form of human likeness, which is radiant. We're talking radiation. We're talking Van Nalen Bell, like the appearance of the glory of Hawa. In short, Ezekiel saw a vision of Hawa sitting throne on the vault of heaven and described as described in Isaiah 40, 22. If the earth were flat a sufficiently 
tall tree would be visible to the earth's farthest bounds. And Daniel the king saw a tree of great height at the center of the earth. Everyone saw this tree reaching with its top to the sky. We're talking the silicon trees, the crystal trees, visible to the earth's farthest bounds. You can't see that on a ball, boss. You can't see the earth's farthest bounds on a ball. It's curved. But if the earth was flat or uh, spread out, like it says in etymology of planet, flat, spread, a sufficiently tall tree would be visible to the earth's farthest bounds, man. But this is impossible on a spherical earth. Likewise, in describing the temptation of Zeus by Satan. <laughs> well, that's an oxymoron. Once tree, once again, the devil took him to the very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. Obviously, this would be possible only if the earth were flat. The same is true in Revelation 1 and 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye shall see him. Not on a ball, boss. Underneath the ball, how are they going to? Underneath the ball, it's up. Up is up. They'll point up. On top of the ball, they'll point up. That's two different directions. Stop playing, boss. Stop the play play, man. It's a lot more in this uh, flat earth Bible, man. We're just talking flat earth. 101. Okay. Oh, what's a rainbow? Multicolored art made by light. Striking water drop is the most familiar type of rainbow, including this one in South Chile. It's produced when sunlight strikes raindrops. Remember the screen. You won't see it without the mist. You won't see it without the screen. But it's always there. How wise, always there. Yeah, I have set my rainbow <laughs> in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant between me and you and all living creatures of every kind. It's a covenant between Hawa and everybody living. And no more floods are going to pop off to reboot you. We coming with fire, though. <laughs> Dragon fire, man. Con, con. Let's keep going. All right, let's have some fun. Uh, <laughs> five ways to make a rainbow. Get part one. We're having fun right now. This is a victory lap. Just notice one common media is that they're going to have to use something to reflect, refract, be some type of mirror. Or some type of screen, right? Let's go. You can create the real rainbow outdoors. Pick a sunny area and turn your back towards the sun. That's the screen, but it's already being reflected by something when you're outside. We're talking a dome, crystal. Let's go. Spray the water in front of you until you see a rainbow. Don't forget that the sun has to be very low in the sky, no more than 42 degrees from the skyline. Create a wonderful rainbow indoors. Slowly raise the glass of water in a sunny place until you see a rainbow on the floor. The sunlight is made up of different colors of glass of water, right? Glass, God, let's go. Light mixed together. A rainbow appears when the sunlight enters a water droplet and splits into many colors. You 
can create a rainbow as long as the sun is shining. Put the bowl of water in a sunny place, such as on a windowsill, so the sun can shine through the water onto the mirror fixed in it. Hold the sheet of paper above the bowl and try to capture a rainbow with it. Again, glass, a medium, it's not just happening without some type of reflection. Let's go. You can still make a rainbow without the sunlight using a small mirror and a flashlight. Mirror. Shine onto the part of the mirror that is underwater. Tilt the mirror until you see the rainbow on. Now notice it's a straight rainbow because you're using a straight mirror. But if that mirror or glass or firmament is curved, then you get an arch, letting you know another proof that the reason we're seeing all this archness is because of an arch situation. Kau. <laughs> Talking this earth as an arched farmer man. Bright white light is also made up of different colors of light mixed together. Did you know that you can split the light using a CD? Oh. Another mirror, boss. Use your flashlight to shine onto the CD. The reflected light will make fabulous rainbow color on your wall. Sign up for my channel. It's always, it's always about reflection. Always about refraction. Yep. We're talking the vault. The vault. And again, man, this Flat Earth Bible is going to give you a lot of drops. So, you know, I don't know if it's the, if it's the original one we used way, way back, man. But it got a lot of drop in it, man. But we did uh, have one. It looked like it had more information in it, too. But it still got, you know, enough, man, it's for you to connect yourself, man. You know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, that's what we all got to do is connect this ourselves. It says kaug literally means circle or encompass, but it doesn't mean spherical, right? It means a circle or encompass. Is this dome uh, something that would be uh, encompassing? You know, circular, like a vault, physical dome. Not scope. How to make a rainbow. I mean, they make these little kid-friendly science experiments. And again, there's more observation that you need some type of medium like glass or crystallized barrier to create it. It's not just the sun's reflection. All their experimentation uses some type of mirror, reflection, reflect, refraction medium, man. is what we call a spectroscope. It's a... All right, she already is using a CD in her thing, man. And she's going to show you how to put it together. I'm just going to kind of skip to when she already got it together. Let's go. ...in the sky after a particularly heavy rainstorm, you can see a rainbow. And that's because the light coming to us from the sun is getting split into its different colors. So in order to see that, our CD is going to act as what we call a diffraction surface. Just like the dome, boss. But basically, it can split those lights into those different colors. You can see as I move this around, hopefully you're able to see a kind of rainbow effect on there. Now, making sure that your CD is put into your spectroscope so that the shiny surface is facing upwards towards the hole and so that the bottom of the CD is right here in this corner. What you then need to do is aim the small slit at the top at your light source and put your eye to the square here. And you want to try and look straight down onto the surface of the CD. So it's going to look something like this. 
and then you carefully tip it up until you get that light coming through and right about there i'm getting a nice rainbow <laughs> i can't do it boss i can't do it man <laughs> i'll leave the late man i can't do it man I can't do this either, man. Y'all believe this, man? Y'all, y'all, y'all think y'all witnesses something real right here? This moonwalk, man. <laughs> Michael Jackson, he he. <laughs> is this real, man? Are they on the moon? This is the Apollo 11 moonwalk, original NASA mission video, EVA mission video, walking on the moon. Is this real? This is the best they can give you in 1970-something, man. Copy. It's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous, man. It's ridiculous, man. Okay. This is what they gave the people. This is what they gave the people, man. Columbia, Columbia, this is Houston, AOS, over. And the people who believed it hook, line, and sinker, man. Oh, the flag is just waving, but they're in a vacuum of space. Let's talk jet propulsion. They always want to plant their damn flags on us, man. <laughs> they always want to plant their damn flags, man. Let's keep going, man, because I guess they just want to get more sovereignty, right? We talked about this Gail Peters flow. We talked about how any map projection changes immensely. <laughs> you look at Africa here, South America, and the Mercator, and we see it closer to norm. That's not even the norm, norm. Right? Right? Yeah, man, that's not even a norm, norm, boss. Let's keep going. This is how we are going to the moon 2019. I'll play a little bit of this as much as my stomach can handle straight from NASA's mouth. Remember, we're just talking, let's, let's talk about propulsion systems and rockets. I'm not an expert, but I would think if you're pushing out lots of gas, you need to be pushing that onto something to counteract that with your forward movement or upward movement in a vacuum. I don't see you counteracting that. What is a vacuum, man? Y'all still sticking with that narrative, NASA, that you're blasting off to a vacuum of space, traveling 67,000 miles per hour, Spinning at over a thousand miles per hour. Are you still sticking with that? This rocket is just going while the earth is moving at 67,000 miles per hour, spinning at 1100 miles per hour. And the same jet propulsion systems of ignition here is supposed to work on the moon. Ignition. Look at this, man. I can't do it. Oh, one more. All right. I can't do it no more. I had to get that last one. <laughs> Ignition. 
1972, America launched nine human missions to the moon, six of which successfully touched down, allowing 12 men to walk on the lunar surface. NASA's next chapter of lunar exploration, called Artemis, has the task of not just going to the moon to create a long-term human presence on and around it, but also to prepare for ever more complex human missions to Mars. In short... If you can create your human presence, it would already be in there. And by making us feel like you're dumbasses, maybe you already are popping off in the worlds beyond the poles. Everything we must be able to do here, we must first do here. So, what will an Artemis mission look like? Everything is designed and tested with our most important element in mind, the astronauts. This is their deep space, human-rated spacecraft called Orion, built in three parts. The crew module, where up to four astronauts will live and work throughout the flight. The service module, with life support systems for the crew and its own engine and fuel reserves. And a launch abort system, with engines... Dude, I think, I thought y'all did this already, in the 70s. Well, now you just figured out how to get past radiation with your Orion uh, capsule? And your jet engines are still working in a vacuum of space. Is that plausible? It's capable of pulling the crew module to safety during launch should anything go wrong. To accomplish the task of launching our crew in heavy payloads, NASA is building the Space Launch System, comprising of a cargo hold, an exploration upper stage, a massive core stage, and two extended solid rocket boosters. Altogether, this is the world's most powerful rocket, and it exceeds the legendary Saturn V of the Apollo era in numerous ways. Sitting on the launch pad, the entire rocket, fully fueled, weighs just over 6 million pounds, 5.2 million of which is just the fuel. Once ignited, there was no stopping what comes next. All four RS-25 engines and the two solid rocket boosters come to life, thundering our crew upwards. Two minutes after ignition, the solid rocket boosters are spent and released. Eight minutes after launch, the core stage is depleted and separated. The upper stage fires briefly, placing Orion into a parking orbit around the Earth. Here, the crew reconfigure the spacecraft Low Earth orbit, they ain't getting past the Van Halen belt, boss. A check system to confirm everything is ready for deep space travel. With a go from mission control, the crew reignite the exploration upper stage engines to leave Earth entirely. The exact timing of this maneuver is critical to reach a speed that can escape Earth's gravitational pull, but also put Orion on a course that will intersect the moon days later. Once the spurn is complete, the upper stage of the SLS is jettisoned and the crew aboard Orion coast for several days toward all that awaits them at the moon. Approaching the moon, we see the fundamental differences between Artemis and Apollo. What happened to the Van Allen Bell, man? Let's talk about it. Y'all just skimped past it this time? How did you get past the radiation? Instead of requiring Orion to serve as an expendable lunar command module or to carry a constrained lunar lander, the Artemis missions will take advantage of a different approach, pre-staging. Everything needed for lunar missions will be positioned in advance by commercial and international partners. This includes rovers, science experiments, and human rate systems on the surface. But it also includes a dedicated lunar station in orbit around the moon called Gateway. Here at this station, we can pre-stage a robust... Come on, bruh. Gateway, we're talking about getting through the gates, the ice wall, the summer gates. Come on, boss. Splinter Lander and establish a strong communications relay. Designed with open standards, the Gateway can be expanded as new missions and partnerships develop, allowing multiple human missions on the moon at the same time and enabling ongoing science to be conducted even between human missions. The Gateway is also capable of adjusting its orbit to allow access to every part of the moon something the Apollo missions could not do. But the real key in this approach is placing Gateway in a unique halo orbit to perfect the maneuvers needed for Mars missions. And with the growing list of commercial and international opportunities, Gateway is the ideal hub between Earth and all that lies beyond. Returning to our crew as they approach Gateway, the Orion must match the elliptical orbit of the station in order to successfully dock. Once on board, pre-selected crew members transfer to the lunar lander. Well, those assigned to Gateway remain on station. The Where's the radiation, boss? Y'all just skipped over this huge problem, man. This is what this is why I got an issue with you scientists, man. You you just choose when to 
leap over things as if the educated aren't going to ask you the same question. How did you get past the Van Allen belt? Our lander system itself is built for three unique steps. Descending from the halo orbit of Gateway down to a low lunar orbit, descending from low lunar orbit to the surface, and once the lunar mission is complete, launching from the surface of the moon and ascending all the way back to the orbiting Gateway. Whoa, 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 whoa. They launched from the surface of the moon to get back to the Earth. Like ignition? I like Stop the cavalry, man. Stop it, man. You stop it right now. Never in the history of cavalry. Never witness. Straight up. Boom. All cabaret, my naga. Let's get into some fundamentals about rockets. It can carry multi-ton payloads into Earth orbit or to the moon. And the scientific space exploration by Saturn rockets will lead eventually to placing a man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. But all the missions planned for Saturn hinge on one essential element of space rocketry. If we fill a sphere with highly pressurized gases, there can be no action and reaction. The pressures are equal in all directions, and the gas remains motionless. But if a hole is cut in the sphere, the pressurized gas rushes to escape thus we have an imbalance of pressure in the sphere in these two directions <laughs> the big lie by nasa directly opposite the opening of forces created by the air as it exits the balloon in reality this is not the case there is no imbalance created the pressure remains every evenly all at all times, the whole hold on, man. God damn. Hold on, man. Super fast, man. Slow it down, man. <laughs> Evenly distributed at all times. The whole time the balloon is deflating. There is equal pressure everywhere. Inside the balloon, pressure decreases equally everywhere. Inside the balloon. All right, all right, all right. We got it. Man. Let's go. Similarly, if we fill a balloon with compressed air, there is a greater pressure within the balloon than outside. When we release the air within the balloon, the column of air escaping. <laughs> the column of air contains the thrust it pushes off the atmosphere, but there's a vacuum of space. How are they getting ignition from the moon? Sets up a momentum going in one direction and the reaction in the other direction, acting as pressure on the interior of the balloon, propels our little rocket. <laughs> we look at a representation of a rocket engine thrust chamber, we see the same principle applied. Through combustion in the thrust chamber, great amounts of energy are released. Watch this guy get his doodle on. He's going to color the whole thing, man. <laughs> Color. Uh, expanding gas. As color, color, color. Color, color, color. This kinetic energy, bursting from the nozzle exit at supersonic speed, generates an enormous force from the mass and acceleration of the gas flow is computed a basic measurement of rocket power. Thrust. The reaction to this thrust is expressed in pressure 
against the top of the chamber, here. But how are you thrusting in a vacuum is what we ask. Against the sides, here, and against the interior wall to the nozzle, here. Forcing the thrust chamber, and with it, the entire body of the rocket, upward. Oh, and one other thing. Many people in the past thought that the rocket required a solid body of atmosphere to push against in order to move. Incorrect. <laughs> Incorrect. So you don't need no atmosphere to push off. Rockets do, in fact, push off the atmosphere. You are about to see this as Moon Hucker proves it by stupid luck and sloppy technique. Hello, man. Man, this is ridiculous, man. And with Newton's third law, which states everything has an equal and opposite reaction, or every action has an equal and opposite reaction. And by just the process of expelling something out the back, you gain forward momentum. But expelling something out the back has to expel onto something, and there's no atmosphere. You're in a vacuum, man. You're in a vacuum. So... Uh oh, oh man, here we go. We'll add our weights. Start. And we'll redo our experiments to make sure it can move under its own weight. Test one. When it was observed, it would also. So this air is pushing off against the atmosphere around it. But in a vacuum, you don't have that atmosphere, according to NASA, man. So none of your propulsion systems make any sense, even when you try to explain it. It behoove us to observe the fact that with added weight, it did move significantly slower than it's without weight, which we can test but again by removing the pennies. Let's verify that it is 29 grams lighter. 107. So that corroborates with our 104 gram carts and the 100, or 103 gram balloon, making 107. So without weight, With weight. Oh man. Ridiculous. <laughs> Moment was still observed. Now this dude's using an actual vacuum, right? He's using a vacuum to simulate the vacuum of space. He's using an actual vacuum, boss. I can't make this shit up. Movement was still observed. Wow. Test number two. Ooh, that rocket slowed down, boss, with a vacuum, boss. <laughs> it was still observed. I did notice it was a little bit slower than without the vacuum. Test number three. NASA says you're in a vacuum of space, not drop. NASA says this, man.
Well, it was still observed. Um, seemed to have been about the same distance as without the vacuum. Four. That rocket ain't moving, boss. Your rocket ain't moving through space suddenly, you know, in the vacuum of space. No movement observed. Five. Now think about this. You're in a vacuum of space. They're saying he's using a vacuum, right? He, he's proving something. How is your water staying on your spinning ball? Traveling at 67,000 miles per hour in a vacuum. And you don't feel shit. You don't feel nothing, boss. Either it's just the most impressive gravity that's only been proven as a theory. Or you are not moving, boss. I love to five eyes my, my jigger. Look up the Michelson Morley experiment. They're trying to measure the Earth's movement through the ether, and there ain't no movement, and even Einstein said he couldn't prove the movement of the Earth. So what, you got some spinning ball without movement of the Earth? Traveling at no miles per hour, but it's just spinning for no reason? Why does Hawaii got to put you in a spinning environment? Why does Hawaii got to put you, my naga, the chosen ones, in a spinning environment so that you never be still ever? Or do you have to realize, do we have to realize that we are firm, fixed, and immovable? Immovable, immovable. <laughs> Foundations, fixed, earth, fashion, fixed, immovable, immovable. Uh, let's go. How do rockets work in a vacuum? Short answer, by propelling fuel in one direction, the rocket moves in the opposite direction. That's Newton's third law of motion. Did Newton test his motion in a vacuum? So why are you using Newton's third law of motion with atmosphere to prove what's happening in a vacuum? Rockets work by utilizing, this is what they're saying. Rockets, this is from Space Century Center. NZ. Okay. Rockets work by utilizing Newton's third law of motion. Whatever action has an opposite reaction, equal, right? For every action, there's an equal opposite reaction. This means that if you apply a force in one direction, an equal amount of force will be applied in the opposite direction, boss but not in a vacuum. Noon's law of motion has nothing to do with vacuum. This is earth experiments. <laughs> the reaction force is the balloon accelerating. We just saw this dude use a balloon and an actual vacuum cleaner. Accelerating the opposite direction. If the lip is facing down, the balloon will accelerate upwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All rockets use the same basic principle. So when they try to say they got some super rocket that has a propellant that doesn't need to use the atmosphere, all rockets use the same basic principle. Shooting stuff out one end of the rocket will make it <laughs> make the rocket move opposite in the opposite direction. Even in a vacuum, remember that vacuum experiment we just saw? Where that thing didn't go nowhere, boss. That's your rocket. All that gas you're spewing out is getting sucked into the vacuum because you say you want a vacuum, boss. Because you say you want a vacuum. There ain't nothing to push against. Nothing to push against. Oh. But we are going to invent gravity. We're going to invent propellants. That's what the propellant is. Something for the rocket to push against. <laughs> in the vacuum, boss. Yeah, y'all got to bring something to the equation. Fakeologist.com with the dude.
this is what you know this person's saying about this uh force <sighs> NASA is lying at a molecular molecular level does rocketry work in a vacuum gas pressure requires molecules to be in contact with each other bouncing off of each other causing millions of collisions per second on earth if you realize or if you release gas into the vacuum of space this vacuum plays heavy the first molecule that pops out will shoot off into the distance at a constant speed. So will the one behind that, never catching up with the first one. You can't have no gas popping off. No pressurized molecules being released from your... Uh, propellant it still wouldn't work propellant is by far the heaviest of the rocket that's what they sell us on but gas pressure requires molecules to be in contact with each other bouncing off of each other causing millions of collisions per second if you release gas into the vacuum of space the first molecule that pops out will shoot off into a distance into the distance at a constant speed, so will the one behind that, never catching up with the first one, the third, fourth, etc. All fly off into the distance, trying to feel the vacuum. You got to equate the vacuum. Can't use Newton's law. It doesn't pertain to the vacuum. By finding their empty corner. So no matter how much gas you produce, none of it will ever change the pressure under the spaceship. Oh, we got super propellants. That's what a propellant is, something for the rocket to push away from itself. Man, no matter how much gas you use, it will never change the pressure under the spaceship. None, if it will ever push the spaceship. To push a spaceship, there must be some locally high pressure under it, which is impossible since the pressure in space is zero everywhere. Think about a fire hose shooting water. A force comes directly against the column of the water shooting out. Why? Because the first drop of water has to pass through air, which is dense, causing many collisions, slowing down the drop of water. The second drop directly behind it, the first behind the first, but not be slowed down by the air, so it will collide with the first drop. The third drop hits the second drop and so on. The fast water coming out the hose, pushing through the slower water outside, causes Newton's third law to push back on the column of water. This is why you need people holding the hose to add an unbalanced force. Otherwise, the hose would not be able to push water through that column anymore. The water column would be diverted and the hose would flop around, <laughs> right? It is, this is repeatable, observable science. It is obvious that one drop of water does not push back on the hose. You need a fast moving column. How do you get that? The nozzle and the mass flow equation in space since the molecules leaving the combustion chamber and entering the vacuum never slow down, never collide with any objects, any outside objects, nor with any each other. Their force is always moving forward, always from the ship. There is no way for that force to be returned to the ship. There is no way for the force of the moving molecules to be extracted and used for propulsion. Their force is carried off into the far corners of space. Nah, boss, we got propulsion. 
propellants. Propellant is by far the biggest and heaviest part of rocket. The payload is small in comparison. One of the main challenges of rocketry is having to launch with so much propellant because we need it, boss. We need to add something to science. Now that propelling propulsion is carried off into the far corners of your space. This is also known as the jewel expansion Remember that as soon as the nozzle is open, the combustion chamber becomes part of the vacuum of space as it is subject to its laws. A closed chamber is under pressure, but not an open one. NASA is lying on a molecular level, but that's okay because most people don't usually look there. The awesome, spectacular, and heroic nature of space exploration is enough to cloud the most logical minds. Most respectable engineering students won't touch space flight, and those who do have tiny departments. If that was really a multi-billion dollar government-funded operation, every school in America would have their hands out for government grants like they do with engineering, computer science, and biology. But why train thousands of the best minds of a generation in a field that doesn't exist? There ain't no splay, space, <laughs> space exploration, boss. You're talking rocketry. Does rocketry work in a vacuum? Of course it does. We have a propellant, boss. What are you pushing against, man? The propellant is a material that spews out the back of a spacecraft, giving it thrust or push for against what in a vacuum often the propellant is a kind of fuel which is burnt with an oxidizer to produce large volumes of very hot gas in a vacuum boss no boss not in the vacuum boss <laughs> it's not popping off these gases expand until they reach out of the back of the rocket, making thrust, but not in a vacuum, boss, because that thrust is being sucked away to the far distant corner. And you're going nowhere, boss. That thrust is being carried off into the far corners. <laughs> And you're going nowhere, boss. This is how they say the Van Allen belt works, man. And with all your knowledge, you can see clearly. There's an invisible magnetic force field surrounding our planet, protecting us from harmful solar wind that could annihilate Earth. But this protective blanket is also a swirling ring full of deadly radiation. And to leave Earth's atmosphere, astronauts have to pass through it. The Van Allen belts are rings of energetic... But that astronaut said he had no idea, right? ...charged particles that have been captured by Earth's magnetic field. They got their name from this physicist, James Van Allen. Back in the 1950s, Van Allen launched a raccoon, a rocket lifted by a balloon above the atmosphere, and it detected the first hint of radiation at higher altitudes. Then, Explorer 1, the first American satellite to orbit Earth, launched January 13, 1958. Explorer 1 confirmed that Earth's magnetosphere was trapping the subatomic particles. The Van Allen belts were the first major scientific discovery of the early space age, and they posed a serious challenge for space travel. High-speed subatomic particles can tear through DNA, increasing the risks of cancer and other diseases. So sending astronauts through these particles is not ideal, and even though they're flying in a shielded spacecraft, doses of radiation can still seep through. But there's no way around the Van Allen belts. In order to reach space, astronauts have to fly through them. First, there's the inner belt, which is comprised of protons. And then the outer belt, which has mostly high-energy electrons. At one point, Van Allen suggested detonating a nuclear bomb in the inner belt to potentially clear out some of these subatomic particles. This plan never happened, but in 1962, the United States did carry out a nuclear explosion in space dubbed Starfish Prime. 
they wanted to see if detonating a 1.4 megaton bomb in low Earth orbit could augment and expand the Van Allen belts. But the explosion actually ended up temporarily adding more radiation around our planet. So with little success on that front, it was up to NASA to build a spacecraft with a strong radiation barrier and figure out a flight trajectory that avoided the thickest, most radioactive parts of the belt while traveling as fast. So what did they have in the 70s, man? If they just have to find a way now. Fast as possible. Scientists determined that if the speed of the Apollo spacecraft was about 25,000 kilometers per hour, it would take about 52.8 minutes to pass through the belts. Based on that information, they found that the radiation dose received during that amount of time would be, at most, 11.4 rads, and that's without the protection of a spacecraft. And since a lethal radiation dose for a human is 300 rads in one hour, NASA deemed the missions a go. <laughs> I thought it was super deadly, but hey, no problem, boss. We'll just make you fly faster through it. Dodge the hijack. In the end, the average radiation dose on the skin of the Apollo astronauts came out to be 0.38 rad, which is about the same radiation you'd receive getting two CT scans on. Stop the, stop the cap. They just said that no living organism would survive it. Now it's just such a small dose. This is what they had to do, my naga, to adjust the mathematics to make it feasible. To make it possible. They had to come back and do a cleanup. I'm just showing you what's happening, man. Do you think they went through this thing? On your head. So while the Van Allen belts are lethal, they could really only kill an astronaut if they were to spend several days in their radioactive vicinity. And despite the challenges the belts create when leaving Earth, we should actually be thanking them for protecting life on our planet from utter annihilation. If you want to see more spacecrafts, check out this... More Capri, man. More Capri. <laughs> you think they got out? We did the... We did... What do you think the United Nations think about this, man? <laughs> What's the UN got to say about this, man? Do you think they got out, man? Huh? 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 I don't know, man. This is uh William Carpenter's 100 Proofs Earth's Not a Glow, number 77. Oh, but if the Earth is a plane, we can go to the edge and tumble over. It's a very common assertion. This is a conclusion that is formed too hastily and facts overthrow it. The Earth certainly is just what man, by his observation, <laughs> finds it to be. And what Mr. Proctor himself says is, seems to be flat and we cannot cross the icy barrier which surrounds it <laughs> this was written in 1800s man this is a complete answer to the objection and of course a proof that the earth is not a glow i'm gonna drop all 100 proofs on y'all this was dropped on uh John Hopkins University, man, by William W.M. Carpenter, man, right on the head bone. <laughs> Just let him know Earth ain't a globe, man. And all these proofs, hey, you got the drop. You got the drop. This ain't no new psyop. This is 1800s drop, man. Ignition, kind. <laughs> Come on, man. Capri, man. We out of here, boy. We out of here, boy. We out of here, boss. You see it, man. You adjust your perspective. You trust NASA. All you can do is go back to science and gravity. Or what about the explorers and finding 
uh, new worlds the size of an Antarctica, like Admiral Byrd is saying, right? Antarctica's popping up. Admiral Byrd is finding the Thoth Amman uh, spell barrier, <laughs> the Thoth moving island. <laughs> Flat maps from 10 centuries ago, my naga. Japanese map showing more land outside of your earth ball. UN flag using the same projection as your uh, your plane. Not a ball. Not a ball. The earth plane. And they got it in targets, man. Crosshairs, man. Admiral Byrd said he saw something the size of America, boss. Not only Bolivian, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole. As big, as big as the United States. Can't make this up, boss. <laughs> I can't make it up, boss. Receipts on receipts. The UN know. Harold Bird knows the greatest explorer. It took 5,000 people to conquer and got turned around real quick, boss. Did the U.S. Navy battle UFOs or did they bat battle dragons, boss? Either way, somehow, some way, they got uh, many fatalities, boss. Many fatalities. And they started detonating the firmament. The plane, the flat, spread out plane, or uh, I'm sorry, planet. Plane. To wander. Stop making them. Stop letting them make you wander, man. Because that's highly problematic, boss. To make devious, repel, dissuade from the right path, bewilder. Don't let these hijacks bewilder you. Get your breath, get your security, get your zanza. Get your, huh? wow, get your tent peg. Spread it out like a tent, man. Spread it out like a, like a tent to dwell in. I, with my own hands, stretched out the heavens and caused all the holes to shine. We're talking about Spread out. By extensions, it can mean roundness. We're talking kawu. The vault of heaven. Firm. Fixed. Immovable. Rakia. Beaten out. Vault of the skies. In the Papa Vu, they call, you know, our father the God of the sky and our mother the God of the earth, hence Mother Earth, right? Like a tent for the dismount. Isaiah chapter 40 for the dismount, part two, flat drop 101, brand new series for my nagas in the front of the class. <laughs> and uh, I know we love our flat drop. A lot of us we love to nine spiral, man. We, we really popped off with this flat drop. You know what I'm saying? You know, we always had the flow. We always had the code within us, you know what I mean? But just part of us, you know, part of the realization of how faulty and fraudulent all this is and the immensity of the lie, of the BS, comes from the orientation. We got our orientation. 
We got our code. We got our indigenous truth. We got our frequency 432. And he that sits above the circle, Kau, right? Kau. <laughs> Kau literally means circle or encompass. Hebrew, Kau. He that sits above the Kau, the roundness, the circle, not the ball, not the sphere, man. Talking about the dome of the fixed, firm, and immovable earth. And that the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretches out the heavens as a curtain, spreads them out as a tent to dwell in. <sighs> wow. Tent wall. Yeah. Tent peg. A lot of tentness going on in the Pictopaleo Hebrew. Your wa is the peg that secures the tent. So we got security, added security, the hook, the foundation, the validation. It's nothing without the breath, the revelation. Flat drop 101, my naga. <laughs> Look out for us. We'll be coming in part three. Just letting you know it's about that time to rediscover for ourselves, the true melanated earth plane. Ahab to cons, allow, a wah. Stay firm, fix it, immovable. Continue to see clearly. Stay up, suit up, choose up.